Hi, and welcome back to this week's Parsha Shir on Sefer Orger Del Yahu. This week we're going to be studying the commentary of the Orger Del Yahu on Parsha Shmos, which we're going to read together this Shabbos in Shul. In our Parsha, the Torah tells us about the heroism of two great women, the Mialdos, the midwives that delivered many of the Jewish babies in the, in the midst of the slavery in Egypt, namely Shifra and Pua. And the Pasuk tells us that as a reward for the heroism exhibited by Shifra and Pua, Vayas lahem batim, that God made for them homes, batim. Simply put, I think we could explain the Pasuk like the Chizkuni does. The Chizkuni says batim, elu banim, that what they were rewarded with because of their heroism in defying the decree of Paro to throw Jewish babies into the Nile, instead saving them and perpetuating the Jewish people, God grants them the gift of batim, the Chizkuni says, elu banim. It doesn't mean he provided them with homes, palaces, you know, homes of bricks and mortar or, or wood or whatever, not physical homes, but uh, homes in the sense of children. Shebanav shel adam nikra ubais. If you look all over Tanakh, says the Chizkuni, oftentimes these two terms are used interchangeably. When the Tanakh says batim, oftentimes it's referring to the children of the people, and therefore, perhaps, as the Ibn Ezra also explains, v'hatam she hir bezaram tik moschar she hechiyu hen zera Israel. There's a perfect correlation between the act and the reward. Shifra and Pua acted in order to save Jewish children, and as a reward, they were granted batim, which we will read as children. They were granted children of their own as a reward for that which they did in very courageously taking their own lives in their hands and defying the decree of Paro. Chazal, very famously in the Gemara and Sota, also quoted by Rashi on our, on our Parsha, tells us that there's perhaps a deeper meaning to Shifra and Pua and to the term Batim. Chazal tell us that Shifra and Pua were not just any two midwives that happened to have emerged as the prominent midwives amongst the Jewish people, but they were actually two prominent, important women from an important family, namely the family of the tribe of Levi. And Shifra is actually Yocheved, and Pua is actually Miriam. And Chazal explain why perhaps they were given the nicknames of Shifra and Pua. Yocheved, of course, being the mother of Moshe Rabbeinu, and Miriam being the daughter of Yocheved, the sister of Moshe Rabbeinu, and of, of Aaron. So Chazal say Shifra and Pua are Yocheved and Miriam. And in response to their act of heroism, of saving Jewish children, they were granted batim, not in the sense of physical homes, not even in the sense of just giving them children, as the Ibn Ezra says, or the Chizkuni says, but something even more than that, something more special than that, perhaps something more unique than that, something more targeted than that, and that is Hashem granted them dynasties of children, specific types of children that would enter leadership positions amongst the Jewish people and be able to really direct the future of the Jewish people themselves. They were granted a reward of Bate Kahuna and Levia and Bate Malchus. The homes or dynasties of the Kohanim and Leviim, who were the descendants of Yochavet, Moshe, Aaron, and eventually the children um, of those families, who would become the Kohanim and Leviim that would serve in the Mishkan and later in the Beis Hamikdash, and Miriam, who married Kalev into the tribe of Yehuda, would be the progenitor of Malchus, of kingship, as she is the progenitor of the line of David Amalek, would not only produce the line of kings, but also the line of kings all the way until. Uh, the coming of the Mashiach. And of course, it's a very appropriate, even on the surface, reward uh, for their heroism. Since their heroism was meant in a certain way, not just to give life to children, as sensitive people would do, but also to give life to the future of the Jewish people, the future of their nation, because of their act, there was a future to the Jewish people. Without them, the Jewish people would have been annihilated then and there in the midst of the slavery of Egypt. So, as a reward for them perpetuating the Jewish people, they are granted children who will become the dynasties of leadership, religious and political, that would direct the future of the Jewish people and continue to do so uh, until the end of time, until the coming of Mashiach. 
The Orgid al says that there's an even deeper level to the correlation between the act of Shifra and Pu of saving children and the reward of, of Batim. And that correlation has to do specifically with the trait exhibited by Shifra and Pua, namely the trait of Yira, of fear, of awe. The Pasuk, the Torah actually tells us twice uh, about this trait of Yira embodied by Shifra and Pua. Once when they actually act to defy the orders of Paro, the Pasuk says, Batir ena hamialdos es elokim, they had such fear of God that they decided not to comply with the orders that Paro had given them directly, which is to throw the Jewish male children into the Nile. Instead, they decided to give life to the children. And again, the Torah repeats this trait of theirs as it spells out the reward that they will get for their heroism, Vayhiki Yaru Hamialdos Es Helokim, because of the fact that these Mialdos feared God, therefore Vayaslahem Batim. Somehow Batim is correlated specifically with the trait of Yira, of fear, of awe that they exhibited. As the Sefer Orgadal Yahu says, Bishar Hayira Gidola Shahaya La Mialdos, because of this great trait of fear that they had. Nitan lahem batim. They were specifically granted. Uh, they were specifically granted batim. Now, Orge Dayau explains that the reason why we could correlate perhaps the reward of batim with the trait of Yira is not just because of the pasuk, but because conceptually in Chazal in Gemaras we have an association between Batim and the trait of Yira. Pirish HaRav HaKadosh Mikatsk, the Katsker Rebbe says, Ki HaKavanu Adas Ma Sh'amru B'Gemara B'Shabbos. The Katsker Rebbe says, if you look at the Gemara in Shabbos, Daf Lamed Aleph, Lamed Aleph, there's a Gemara over there that naturally ties the concept of Batim, of homes, and the concept of Yira. To tell us, Shehayira Nikra B'Shem Ba'is. Sometimes, even in Chazal, Yira is known by the word Ba'is, or home. V'haschar shenitan lahem bishvil hayira ha'gadol ha'shaya lahem, hu shiye lahem beis moshav lahayira. Somehow, what the Torah was trying to convey to us in our parsha is that because these women exhibited the trait of Yira, they were rewarded with homes which would embody that Yira Going, going forward. We have to take a step back from this Orgadal Yahu and try to understand what exactly is the correlation between bias and yira, between home and fear. The Orgadal Yahu says, Hayira nikra b'shem bias. The reason why yira is sometimes referred to as a bias, as a home, is ki al yedei hayira ha'adam mugdar. If you think carefully about the trait of fear, through the trait of fear, a person becomes mugdar, bounded, like from the word geder, there's a fence put around them. Vezehu habachina shel bias. And if you think about it, that is the essence of a home. What is a home? A home is a place that has walls, that is surrounded on all sides, a place that has boundaries, a defined space, a space specifically instituted in order to keep certain things out and in order to keep certain things in. In the physical sense, just the plainest sense of all, a house, the walls of a home, the roof of a home, the enclosed space of a home is meant to keep out the elements of nature, rain, wind, snow, whatever might come your way and protect that which is inside or to keep out people, robbers, or unwanted guests, or anything that you might want to keep, animals, whatever you might want to keep on the outside, the walls, the boundaries, the home, is meant to keep things out. In addition to that, it's meant to keep things in. What happens in the privacy of a home stays within the privacy of the home, specifically because the home is bound. There are things that a person would do either alone or with other people in their home that they specifically want to keep in their home, things that they wouldn't do on the outside. A home is meant to keep things in and to keep things out. It is to set a, a boundary, a very definitive boundary um, that makes the space different inside from outside. And if you think about it, the trait of Yira, of fear, is exactly the same. As an emotion, it shares very similar characteristics. We constrain ourselves 
We recoil into ourselves when we feel or exhibit the emotion or the trait of Yira. In the physical sense, if you have something chasing you, God forbid, a, a, an animal or a person, and, and you're deathly afraid, you physically recoil into yourself. You'll hide. You'll go into the fetal position. You'll try to protect yourself in some way by going into yourself or perhaps even running away, which is further recoiling. But certainly, you'll recoil from the person or the event or the circumstance into yourself. It's a bounded experience in the physical sense, in the emotional sense as well. When you stand before a person or a moment of great fear and trepidation, you humble yourself. You control the way you speak. You change your volume, you change your tone, you think more carefully and you decide what can I say, what can't I say, how can I act, how can't I act. It's an experience of limitation. It's an experience of boundaries and it's experience that forces you to be more thoughtful about that which you do and that which you don't do. And therefore, the concept of a home and the concept of Yira are very similar, says the Gemara says the Rebbe Mikotsk, says the Orgidal Yahu, and therefore says the Torah, when Shifra and Pua, Yocheved and Miriam, exhibited this trait of Yira, of fear, of knowing how to bound themselves, how to be more thoughtful, and how to create restrictions and limitations to themselves where they wouldn't give in to the dictates of Para, but rather retreat from him, recoil from him into themselves and their own meaning and their own world and their own values to listen to HaKadosh Baruch Hu and realize how they were humbled before HaKadosh Baruch Hu in fear of him, to listen more carefully to that which Hashem told them than to what Paro told them. Because of that trait, they were granted Batim, symbolically speaking, the, um, the, the parallel to the trait of Yira. What were they granted? They were granted dynasties of leaders that would inspire Yira within the people, continue to inspire the trait which they embodied. Of course, the Kohanim and Leviim in their incredible spiritual heights would instill not Yira in the sense of fear, but in the sense of awe and reverence amongst the people who would, who would watch them, who would see them, who would realize they're on a very high level. And the same is true of kings. A king inspires a certain level of awe, of reverence, of, of recoiling before a king, of humbling yourself before a king. And in, of course, in the case of Jewish kings, proper Jewish kings, as well as the case of Kohanim and Levim, the awe and the trepidation, the, 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 uh, the fear, the yira that they are inspiring is not an awe and a reverence of themselves, but it's an awe and a reverence of what they represent. And what they represent is the Torah and, of course, HaKadosh Baruch Hu himself. And therefore, it's an incredibly appropriate reward that the trait of Yira becomes ensconced in the Jewish people because of Yocheved and Miriam and the kings and Kohanim that were their descendants continue to remind the Jewish people of that trait. As the Orgadal Yahu says, B'schut zeni tan lahem aschar lidoros. They get a reward that lasts for generations. Sheyeh lahayira kvius etzel b'nei Yisrael. That Yira, that trait, would have a permanence amongst the Jewish people, Etzel Kohanim, Etzel HaMalachim, amongst the, the Kohanim and amongst the kings. Yira, fear, I think, is one of the hardest traits for us to be able to, to feel because we often don't let ourselves feel fear, especially in the modern world we live in. We, we try to stay away from feelings of trepidation, of awe, of fear, of authority, we hardly understand those concepts. Once upon a time, in the era of kings and queens, and unfortunately, in sometimes the eras of, of dictators, uh, one understood what it meant to stand before a figure that inspired Yira, that inspired awe in a person. In today's much more uh, egalitarian society, a society that, that stays away from authority and, and, and fosters a, a much more equalizing sense of people, I think we, we tend to not be able to see in a concrete fashion what era, what awe, what trepidation uh, really looks like. And therefore, it's much harder to be able to fear, feel that. And of course, it's much harder to feel it 
towards HaKadosh Baruch Hu, who is ultimately transcendent that we don't see before us than it would be to see in the eyes of a natural human queen or king or leadership figure that inspired uh, that within us. Miriam Yocheved uh, left us a legacy of this very important trait of Yira, a trait of Yira that is crucial in defining who we are as human beings and in defining a big piece of our relationship or our, what our relationship should be with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. We have to work doubly hard to imagine the Yira of Shifra and Pua, the imag to imagine the Yira of Miriam and Yocheved, were able to stand up for their values and to stand up for what they believed in and to fear Hashem and what Hashem expected of them, and what their nation expected of them, more than what other human beings expected of them. And if we imagine that just a little bit, hopefully we can tap into that and feel inspired to follow in their ways as well. Shabbat Shalom.